Well, when I was uh, thinking about uh, how to address you this afternoon uh, and how to construct the uh, presentation entitled The Transformation of Academic Publishing in the Digital Era, I went back in history, went back in time a long, long way. And I looked at things like the cylinder seal printing of Syria. And I looked at Chinese woodblocks and uh, what influence that had on academic publishing. I looked then, rushing forward in time, at the Gutenberg Press, which we all know uh, had such an important role to play in hailing the Renaissance. And then fast forward into the digital age. And then I thought about, well, what is it that I actually want to be talking about here today? And I realized that my title was wrong. It, it was just too, too vast, and I couldn't deal with it all. So I've retitled what I'm going to say to the following. Why don't publishers sleep well at night? Now, I gather there are some of you from the publishing world here in the audience today. Um, those are the people here, by the way, who have bags under their eyes. <laughs> but let's start out from the academic's perspective. What is it that academic authors actually want from publishers? Well, historically, we know it was books and journals. Uh, Publishers bring independent verification of quality, branding, visibility, marketing, and sales, and now increasingly content in multiple formats. And increasingly, authors are asking for free at point of use. And from this, what do academics get when they publish? As we know, recognition, promotion, and research grants. So going back to the old model, we have uh, the following. Let's, let's just look at some of the features. Uh, the print copy only. Publishers were the gatekeepers. They verified and branded as, as we wish them to do. Uh, but they were the bankers. They financed the publishing process. And I'm very careful with the words that I'm using, financed, not funded, financed. And not the research, but just the publishing process. And given that we were delivering in print, cost was a barrier to dissemination. And there were limits to the formats, limits to the channels of distribution, limits to availability. Content was scarce. Well, in the new world, what have we got? Well, we've got multiple versions in digital form and in print sometimes still. We have multiple formats. We have content available through multiple channels. They're held in a multiplicity of locations, now increasingly institutional repositories on authors' websites, more and more different places where you can find content. Free versions are in competition with publishers, and there's great uncertainty over who pays and when they pay for the publishing process. We live in a world where content is abundant. Now, before we go on further, I'd like to knock one issue on the head, which is the one that we talk about endlessly, <laughs> what place for print today. Yes, it's true that uh, some libraries are doing away with print altogether, but those are really in the minority and they're in the uh, well-developed, wealthy Western uh, world. We know that librarians are worried about digital compatibility over time. Will that which we publish digitally today be readable with the software that we we'll have in 20, 50, 100 years' time. We know that there are specialist librarians who still want to keep collections of physical copies. And there's another thing that we know, and um, this is something perhaps not so widely known, but you know, if you do the math about G 
just how expensive it is to print out, say, a 300-page book uh, from your online version. And we all know the academics that do this. They print out, and then they put it in their office, and it's on their shelves, and they're the only ones that read it. Well, institutionally, librarians know that if two or three people in an institution do this, the actual cost is more than buying the book and sticking it into the library. So there are certain types of books that people still don't want to read on readers, still want to have in print, and are still willing and able to pay for. Will this be forever? Maybe, maybe not. But we're talking about now and the foreseeable future. It's also, by the way, incredibly environmentally unfriendly to keep printing out masses of copies. And of course, we have to remember that parts of the world simply do not have access to the web in the ubiquitous manner that we have with broadband, etc. They will. It's happening soon. Uh, it's wonderful to see some of the innovations that are happening, also mobile te te telephones. But for the time being, we have to take those conditions into account. And of course, there are some people who just like holding a book in their hands. So these are my assumptions about print. They may be at variance with your assumptions, and we'll talk about that later, perhaps. But um, I just want to park that. So what are the drivers of change in academic publishing at the moment? Well, I've just made a list here. You can make your own lists, and there's several other issues that uh, we can talk about. But one of them I think is terribly important, and that is the expansion of higher education globally. More and more higher education institutions, that means more academics, that means more publishing, because academics have to publish. We are seeing massively more content appear. We're watching changes in teaching methods. We're seeing that there are changes in how we create learning objects for our students. There are huge questions about intellectual property rights and its regulation. Is it fit for purpose for the technologies that we have today? I would argue not quite. Doesn't mean we should throw out copyright, but it could be reformed. And then we have the pressures on the old system through open access and institutional repositories. Where is that leading us? And are they the most efficient and effective ways to get to where we would like to be? And then I mention again the competition of free content. So those are the drivers of change. And now I want to look at a few obstacles to the transition. And much of my talk is going to concentrate on these obstacles. And then I will also look at some new models and how we deal with these things. And with each of these four areas, I'm only going to give a little example, because uh, you can spend all day talking about any one of these. Um, so the first one, uh, disruptive nature of digital technology. Well, let's go back to Gutenberg. Well, let's get, get some definitions out of the way first. What is a disruptive technology? It's a term describing a technolo technological innovation, a product or service, to overturn the existing dominant technologies or status quo products in a market. Now, Clayton Christensen is generally attributed to have coined the word disruptive technology. And he said, it's the strategy or business model that a technology enables that creates the disruptive impact. And I thought I'd better own up. I picked it up from Wikipedia. <laughs> but it's in small print. So let's go back to our friend Gutenberg. <coughs> Not a very threatening piece of kit, wouldn't you say? Well, it's a rather nice sort of thing. I'd kind of like to have one like that in my living room. However, it sits in a museum. But 
what it had, what it unleashed on the world was just amazing. <coughs> now, about 20 years before Gutenberg, uh, the Cambridge University Library contained 122 books. These were hand copied, hand bound volumes. They were considered to be extremely valuable. They were valued at the equivalent of a vineyard. That's a lot of money per book. But once Gutenberg came in and the movable type came along, it opened up literacy to the middle classes, who then challenged the clergy and their power uh, on access to knowledge. And in due course, it led to things like the Reformation etc. You can go on and on about the changes. That is disruptive technology. And looking at how the cost of the book fell over the centuries, we now know that a bottle of wine is about what a book costs. And that's a huge difference. That's disruptive technology. And that's the kind of change we're going through now. But instead of taking several centuries, it's taking a few decades. And we can hardly keep up with it. Another obstacle to change is the complexity of the present system of academic communications. It's hugely complicated. And I'm, I'm just going to give um, a few little pointers as to what happens when you start tinkering a bit with the existing system. What kind of unintended consequences do you uh, in create when you want to change from one model to another model? Um, the there, there's been a really excellent report that has been published called Activities, Costs, and Funding Flows in the Scholarly Communication System of the UK. I didn't know when I was preparing this that they would be leaving flyers, which I uh, think you should all take, uh, about because this is a really good report uh, funded by the four UK uh, higher education funding bodies, the three national libraries, and the seven research councils. Uh, they set up something called RIN, the Research uh, Information Network, which was tasked with looking at just what does the, the global uh, scholarly communications look like uh, in economic terms. And I'm going to go through a, f a l few of their findings. They cl claimed, and, and one can argue these figures, but let's just take them as given, that the production of research outputs in the scholarly community is valued at about 116 billion pounds globally. That production, distribution, and access, 25 billion. And they even uh, costed the time that academics take to read the material that they publish. Uh, I think this is rather novel, but good thing to know, 34 billion. And of the 25 billion, the, the middle line there, looking at that more closely, the global cost of publishing and distributing of journal articles in English uh, came to 6.4 billion pounds. The fixed costs, the variable costs, etc. OK, this is a lot of money. And some people claim to have found ways of reducing the costs. Um, and Rin is looking at just how to reduce the costs of scholarly communications. Uh, they then looked at the open access model with the author side publication fees. Um, I, are you all aware of how this works, the open access? Um, basically, the, the author pays the fees 
of publishing to the publisher, in general, that comes from the research grant of the author, not from the author's pocket. But it tends to be referred to as the author's side uh, publication fee. Now, what they looked at was what would happen globally if all academic libraries shifted from a subscription model, which is the historic model and which has been duplicated in the digital era, what would happen if it flipped over to the author side publication fees model and, and thus allowing open access? And they found the following, that the fall in academic library subscriptions would come to 2.91 billion pounds. This is the good news. But the bad news was that the author fees that would then need to be paid by the academics through their institutions would come to 2.92 billion, net saving nil. Um, does, this, does this matter? Well, of course, these are the numbers. What it doesn't say are the benefits of the open access route for readers. So there are decisions to be made there. But then they looked more carefully at what the implications would be for the United Kingdom. And that is really interesting because the fall in the subscription charges for the library would be 128 million. But the author side fees would come to 213 million. Now, by my arithmetic, that means someone's got to find 85 million pounds to fund the author side fees. Why is that? Because the, um, because we as a country actually contribute more in articles as a proportion of the number of institutions subscribing. Um, now, I think there may be one or two people from RIN here in the audience, and I'm hoping that afterwards they will tell us a, a little bit more about uh, their report. Um, but the point of my showing this to you is not to say that this is a good thing or a bad thing, or that money should be spent this way or not spent this way, but that what we need to do is to be very clear about the economic impact of the changes that we want to see. And you know, the open access movement started as an ideological movement. It was meant to be an Elsevier bashing movement. Uh, but thankfully, it has moved on to being something where we can discuss sensibly and calmly uh, how we want to see this rather large pots of money allocated. So that's my illustration of the complexity of the system that we're looking at. Now, <laughs> this is even more complicated. <laughs> Copyright laws and intellectual property rights. So I thought here we would look first at IPR issues from the scholar's perspective. This is a list that was prepared by Fred Friend, who is a consultant to JISC uh, and someone highly respected in the world that spends most of their time worrying about these issues. And as you can see, access, will the text and data in research papers be accessible and under what licensing conditions, publication, how, how are we going to publish in journals or through institutional repositories and personal websites? What about ownership? Who, who will claim ownership to the content? Um, reuse. How restrictive do we want to allow re reuse to be, even for academic purposes? And management, how will text and data silos be managed and by whom? And finally, preservation. 
uh, which is a, an increasingly important issue as we see, especially now that Google has given us the numbers, that approximately 70% of those books that are in copyright uh, but out of print are orphan works. And if you're not familiar with that term, it's a situation where we can't find the copyright holder, so we can't ask for the permissions that we want uh, when we want to uh, make use of material. So how do we attribute and define ownership in the digital age? Well, there are some changes afoot. Licensing. Uh, for example, the Creative Commons license. I suspect you've all heard uh, something about Creative Commons, but the uh, principle of it is a very simple one. It opens the license, which a rights holder uh, declares to the world that he or she is allowing the world some rights, and reserve, the rights holder is reserving other rights to themselves. Um, this is a particularly useful license, I think, for the commercial world because we can online designate by wrapping this license uh, into the metadata so that it can be expressed online. It, and we can say, look, world, you can use the material for non-commercial purposes only. There are, about, there are three different licenses which we can talk about later, but the, this particular license I think is particularly interesting to, to publishers because uh, it, it opens up the internet to be used as a library. It allows a, a sort of broader conception of fair use, or fair dealing, which I think is, is, is quite important. Uh, we have the institutional repositories. These are, um, this is an initiative which grew out of the library world uh, and through academic administrators who in some cases are actually mandating their faculty, although that's few and far between. In other cases are simply requesting that their faculty deposit their research into their institutional repository and then those pieces of research are made available online free of charge. Is this going to be effective? I've read lots of articles by lots of librarians. Some say it's wonderful, we've reinvented the, the job description of librarians, we have a, a raison d'etre that we didn't have before, <coughs> this is great. And others say, hey, nobody's depositing their, their material with us. We've got this whole infrastructure set up and it's, it's not working. Uh, it's a waste of resources uh, and so on. So I think the jury is still out uh, on how this will work. But I think that if it is going to work, then some kind of partnership with the world of publishing is desirable because one of the reasons why librarians are worrying about this is because they've discovered that it requires certain publishing skills uh, because this material which is posited in their institutional repositories isn't necessarily in the format that's user-friendly. So that's a whole issue that needs working on in the digital age. And open learning resources. This is a growing movement. This isn't just about a few uh, techy savvy academics putting stuff online. We actually have something, for example, called the Commonwealth of Learning. This is a body that was created by the 53 heads of state of the 53 Commonwealth countries, uh, whose um, objective is to promote open access and um, open use and shared use of materials bypassing professional publishing altogether. And then there's some other issues which I just want to flag. Amazon and Google, booksellers or librarians. Um, Amazon started out selling hard copy books, had relationships with publishers, 
That all went very well. Now they are so big that publishers are worried that they're a threat because they actually have their own printing facilities. They actually have their own uh, almost vanity press type publishing uh, facilities that they offer to people. And so again, lots of free content, a lots of also paid for content that hasn't had a necessarily the kind of publishing input that we, we like to see. Mm. Google. Google wanted to be, wants to be, the biggest library in the world. It wants to put all 18 million books uh, in the world online. And um, the book search program, which you're all familiar with and which has been terribly helpful to, to researchers, um, is just a first step. And uh, if we have time, we can talk about the Google settlement uh, later in discussion, where Google is effectively becoming uh, the, uh, will be the prime source where bibliographical and copyright information of books will reside in the new book uh, registry, which they are creating. Friend or foe, there's no agreement on that. And of course, the hardware, software developments, and the uh, mobile phones, and, and, and all that that, uh, that that implies. And DRM, digital rights management, one of the things that uh, publishers had been hopeful about was being able to uh, lock down their content so that they could sell it online through digital rights management systems. Uh, but they've been watching what has happened in the music world, and this is something that they do not want to replicate. Uh, suing 12-year-olds for copyright violation for billions of dollars is not exactly the way <coughs> to win hearts and minds uh, and keep your customers happy. And publishers on the whole think this is not a good idea. So. DRM is not a solution to their problems. So let's look a little bit at uh, reconceptualizing and revising copyright. Again, we could spend weeks talking about this. It's an um, absolutely fascinating subject. But there are a few things that I think we need to be, be clear about. That First of all, we need to simplify licensing. It's terribly complicated. It evolved at a time when it was a controllable thing to do, but in the digital world it, it really isn't. And we need to think of ways to decriminalize the copy for non-commercial use. This comes from the music industry primarily, but it also uh, has um, much relevance to the print world. And we need to promote means of establishing ownership and then respect those rights. And finally, we need to distinguish from the content uh, and the vessel that carries the content. And I think this is a conceptual thing. We think of the book and we need to think more of content rather than the delivery mechanism. So um, just briefly under copyright, uh, I want to talk about a few positive developments that uh, are encouraging on the, to simplify things. We have ACAP, the Automated Content Access Protocol. This is something that endeavors to be an industry standard, which uh, is being spearheaded by the World Association of Newspapers, the International Publishers Association, uh, and various other bodies. Many of the main publishing houses around the world are supporting this in initiative, a standard that allows us to include in the metadata the licensing information, the copyright information, <coughs> so that anybody going online uh, knows all the details, can't actually uh, excuse themselves for violating the terms and conditions because he didn't know it is in the, will be in the metadata. And equally, 
Creative Commons is doing the same thing with something called CC Plus. And again, this is a protocol which allows uh, people to express further permissions information in the Creative Commons license. And then there are initiatives like Strategic Content Alliance, this is in the UK, which is trying to create a standardized policy for the public sector as to how it licenses the materials that it creates, and it's promoting the Creative Commons licensing, and how it handles uh, and understands the issues around the copyrighted materials that it uses. And of course, click-through licensing, this is the nirvana when if you do have to pay for something online, you just press a button and the cost will um, be deducted from your credit card. We're, we're, we're there and uh, it's, um, it's very exciting to see that uh, th this will certainly reduce the transaction costs of licensing quite a lot. So that gets me to the fourth obstacle that I want to talk about publishers' fears. They're very, very worried indeed. The house seems to be crumbling, or at least <coughs> a few years ago they were very worried. They're beginning to be a little bit less worried now, or at least they won't admit to being terribly worried. Uh, but uh, there are some significant concerns facing uh, publishers whether they be commercial publishers or society publishers or university press publishers, <coughs> all of whom serve the academic community. So here are some of the issues that they're facing. The cost of digitization conversion. We don't really know how much this is going to cost us. The cost of digital distribution. We don't know that either, really. We need to reskill our staff. This will entail redundancies of some people bringing on other people. There are real human costs here and issues that publishers face every day. What role of the bookshop and the library supplier in this chain? That's a, a really important question, particularly now as some of the big bookshops are introducing espresso machines. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm not talking about coffee. I'm talking about a small POD machine that will take an electronic file of a book and create a book two minutes later. So you can go into now, not too many because they're only in prototype, but this is being, will be scaled up quite significantly in the next few years. You can go into a bookshop and say, I want this book. It's not in stock. Print it for me. And it'll be printed, and off you go. How is this all going to evolve? So then, um, also bearing in mind the expansion of the academic ecosystem, the new forms of scholarly communications that are all bypassing publishers, the threat of free content. And we need to be defining what it is that the publisher is selling. When content was scarce, it was the value. But with content being abundant, people only expect to pay for the added value. But what does this mean? Now, I'm assuming there are some people in here who are not from the publishing community, and I'm going to go over some very basic arithmetic on the costing of a book. And for those who are publishers here, please bear, <laughs> bear with me. Uh, I know that for different types of books, the margins are different, and uh, we really don't want to go down that route. I'm just trying to illustrate a point, and, and, and you'll see uh, uh, where I'm going with this. So the 15-pound book that you would buy if you were walking down to Blackwell's and, and, and decided you wanted that book that cost 15 pounds, well, Blackwell's would probably take about five pounds of that bookshop's cut. So the net sales revenue to a publisher is about 10 pounds. Let's assume the printing costs are three pounds. Royalties, which are expressed as a percentage of the 
revenue would be, say, 10%, so you've got one pound. Gross profit, six pounds, 60%. Then come the other costs, which are fixed costs, such as editorial and marketing overheads, sales and distribution, rent, staff, etc. Leaving, in this instant, instance, a net profit of one pound fifty, fifteen percent. Most publishers are very happy if they make fifteen percent. Elsevier would cry, of course, but but the rest of us, fifteen percent is 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 okay. Um, but what happens when we're talking about the digital content? Well, we're not quite sure where this is going. We're not quite sure what the net sales are going to be per unit. We don't know how much the unit is going to cost because we're not sure how many we're going to sell and we don't even know exactly what costs we're going to be incurring because this is such a, a world of flux and we can't calculate the royalty. This is when we're thinking about this in advance because we don't know how much we're going to be earning. Uh, so we end up not knowing where our gross profit it, uh, margins are. We reckon that the editorial and marketing overheads <coughs> are probably about the same because that's real human labor and input. We can assume that there's a drop in sales and distribution overheads because we don't have to have a warehouse in the digital world. And we can assume that staff and rents and over such overheads reduce because we don't have to have all that paraphernalia that we did in the print world. However, we still don't know what our net profit is going to be. And this kind of risk, this kind of unknown, is something that uh, publishers are, are, are not comfortable with. This, this, is, this is not a comfortable place to be. So when you look at these numbers and then also consider that from the licensing point of view and the contractual point of view, things are changing as well. Today, the author uh, enters into effectively an exclusive contract with the publisher. Tomorrow, it's much more likely that this relationship will be on a non-exclusive non basis. And we'll see in a minute why. Equally, as you move on, the, in the print world, the publisher entered effectively into an exclusive relationship with the reader. There are certain things you could do with the book, and there are certain things you couldn't do with the book, and everybody knew what they were. Uh, tomorrow, this is unlikely to be the case with our multiple versions, with our uh, Creative Commons type licensing, uh, we're not going to see the publishers have such control, and nor should they because they are no longer the bankers. They no longer have to finance the very long and expensive process of publishing. What's going to be left, we'll see in a moment. But I think this uh, actually is a representation of how, what kind of world we're moving into. So the author will enter into a non-exclusive relationship. The publisher will be able to put the essence of the, co of the content online. And the reader can choose from where it takes the information. And, but publishers will be asked and will want to provide value-added services. And the question will be, how will this be funded? I'll get to that in a minute. Now, today, the kind of model we're looking at online uh, is something like what we have up here. <coughs> the premium content, which is the fully published, the fully published, processed material with the peer review, with the copy editing, with the formatting, that is charged for. 
but publishers are increasingly putting free content around that charge for material in order to generate the business, in order to get people to come onto the site. Um, that's fine, but the question that I've been asking is, what happens if you invert that? What happens if the premium content is free, but you charge for the print version, and you may charge for other things that are still to be developed, services and activities. Well, we're moving some way towards that. Uh, we have got uh, taking, uh, going back to our premium content model where the premium is charged for, uh, people developing various activities around uh, the charged for material. And the, the best example that I know of this one is uh, the Nature model, Nature Publishing Group, where the magazine has 60,000 subscribers. But the people who buy into these various activities, either charged for or not, there are about two million of them. And all of this has massively increased the profile of Nature magazine. And so I come again to my question, what would happen if we put the free, we put premium content online for free and actually made our money from this universe around? And so the publication, as it were, is the whole circle rather than just the inner circle. Now to get to that point takes investment. And uh, that's a problem. But the pressures are there, and the pressures are there, and I'm just going to take a, a slight diversion here, to uh, the n issue of metrics. Metrics is measuring scholarly authority. Now, Michael Jensen, who's director of the um, Strategic Web Communications for the National Academies in the States, he has this three Web 3.0 model where there are 17 measures, metri 17 metrics on which to measure the quality <coughs> and the authority of any particular uh, scholarly uh, publication. And I'm not going to go through them. All I want to say is that only one has anything to do with publishers at the moment. But where I think there might be some scope for added value in helping with the author be more competitive is in uh, what we can do with, with some of these others. So new business models, they are happening. Publishers are already offering a mix of free and paid content. Tomorrow's business models will employ a mix of exclusive and non-exclusive licensing. And I'm going to um, run through a few pioneering examples of just how this works. Um, HSRC Press, Human Sciences Research Council, South Africa, based in Cape Town. Their mission is to open up quality social science research in Africa, about Africa, for Africa, and the world. And their business model is a very simple one, that they put their books online free of charge on an open content license, while they're also selling print books. Now, it has to be said, this is a non-profit organization and their overheads are somewhat absorbed in the state. Nevertheless, since they've been offering their content online free of charge, their sales have increased by 240 percent. That's a huge amount. But on top of that, the council itself has been able to raise far more funding for additional research because they've been much more visible. And that's a real success story. I want to mention very briefly the OPEN project. Now, this is a, 
a project which just began in, in September, October. It's a European Union funded project with these university presses and it's uh, supposed to run for 30 months. It's a pilot project and they're <coughs> aiming to establish cost savings by collaborating and also putting their material online and selling it uh, in print on a POD, print on demand basis. But what the, they're trying to also do is, in addition to trying to have a sustainable business model, unfortunately the sustainability is going to be dependent on attracting subsidies. And um, I'm going to come back to that issue in, in a moment. <coughs> the National Academy Press in the United States has, has for some time now made much of its content available free online. Um, the trouble is it's kind of messy. Some PD PDFs can be read for free. Some can be downloaded. Some of the downloads are charged for. It's not always clear what you can uh, remix and reuse. So while they were pioneers, the whole package um, doesn't quite add up to what we'd like to see uh, in, in, in my publishing operation. Another very interesting example is Flat World Knowledge. Now this is a startup company and it's a real startup. <coughs> Having raised some venture capital, uh, it's a couple of guys who left Prentice Hall in the States. Um, they spent 90 days touring the States in a beat-up uh, VW van. Uh, going around asking professors of business studies in American colleges what kind of textbooks they need. And out of that, very much demand driven, they have commissioned business studies textbooks for the U.S. college market. And they're putting these all up online on a Creative Commons non-commercial license. They're charging for the print edition. Black and white one price, color version, more expensive. You can buy individual chapters in print. You can buy audio, webcasts, study guides, teacher guides. And what's really clever about this is they're creating a little marketplace for other uh, people to sell their products that are in the area of business studies. Now, their first publications are coming out very soon. It's a company to watch and another company that's being watched quite a lot at the moment is uh, my own. Uh, <laughs> when we launched Bloomsbury Academic in September 2008, um, I was slightly concerned. Uh, I wasn't quite sure how the publishing community would react to this. I wasn't also, also, I wasn't quite sure how the open access movement friends of mine would react to this. Uh, but I got about a thousand emails in the first 48 hours and I would say that most of them, in fact about 99% of them were very positive. So I'm very pleased with that. And what we're doing is publishing in the social sciences and humanities and we're publishing everything on a Creative Commons non-commercial license. Now we're the first commercial publishing company to do this on a fully commercial basis uh, and also um, being committed to putting the whole list out on a non-commercial uh, open content license in the digital medium. But we are at the same time providing all the traditional publishing services that our academic authors would like to see. The peer review, the copy editing. <coughs> we um, hope that our reputation will soar very quickly and uh, we will be competitive with the best of academic publishing houses globally. 
And as we get more comfortable with our platform and with the business model, and we show that we too can uh, sell lots of books in print, we will then be thinking about adding uh, other services around the model. So to, s to summarize, what I tried to do here uh, is to bring together some of the main issues in, uh, in my talk and lead up to the conclusion that in the digital era, uh, we will actually need to address where publishers, where publishing companies actually sit in the value chain. Now, th very simply put, the funding sources, all of them, public, private, whatever, <coughs> one basket up there. They fund research, they fund libraries. And then we ask of publishers to take the content from the research, do their magic with it, and then sit there waiting for the libraries to buy the journals, to subscribe to them, to buy the monographs, so that that content, after having gone through this long journey through the publishing houses, reaches the libraries and the readers. And that process is long. And because it's long, it's risky. And because it's long and risky, publishers have to factor that into their calculations. And so the financing issues that they face uh, are problematic, shall we say the least. And now that's all being challenged uh, with the ability for the research to go straight into the university library institutional repositories, going straight into the hands of readers through <coughs> author websites, department websites, etc. But most of the academics I talk to still want those traditional publishing services. So how do we make that happen? Well, what would happen if we conceptualized publishers differently? If we thought of publishers not as bankers, uh, as the people who finance the print and the process of warehousing books and journals until such time that somebody may or may not want to buy them. What would happen if we simply say there's a publishing function and it has to occur somewhere between the research and the final reader, usually in a library uh, repository of some sort, and that that got paid for via a much shorter route. This is highly contentious. And I'm sure if there are any economists in here, they'll tear this apart. But I'd like to just start thinking about this differently. And finally, in order to help everyone think differently, uh, I'd like to just uh, have a little plug for um, my first baby. Uh, we only started in September, but last month we published Remix. Our Remix, uh, subtitle Making Art and Commerce Thrive in the Hybrid Economy, written by Lawrence Lessig, who is the co-founder of Creative Commons. Uh, it's a great read, but I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, it's a wonderful book. I hope all of you will read it at some point. And uh, after the uh, discussion, I'd like to present this copy to the center, to Bill. And thank you very much for listening to me.